Hey there, it's Debbie, and welcome to Playback Friday. I'm going back into the archives and re-releasing some of my favorite conversations from years ago every Friday. Unless you're a longtime listener of the show, there's a good chance you haven't heard this one yet. And even if you are, you just may get something completely different from listening to it this time around. You have to start with something that's not overwhelming. It has to feel emotionally safe and it has to feel doable to them. Okay, you have to find that threshold and you're going to have to scale way, way back. And again, there can be a cascading effect. So once you get them started a little bit, a little bit more and a little bit more, then you can open the door way more eventually. So it's very hard, I think, because parents are like, this needs to happen now. And you're right, it does. But it's not. So you need to back up and really feed the bite size so tiny for whatever issue you're working on. Welcome to Tilt Parenting, a podcast featuring interviews and conversations aimed at inspiring, informing, and supporting parents raising differently wired kids. I'm your host, Debbie Reber, and this week is a continuation of last week's episode with executive functioning coach Seth Perler, which is so packed full of information and also so long that I had to break it up into two separate episodes, which I'm now referring to as a masterclass in executive function. In last week's episode, Seth shared his protocol for setting up a child for success in their developing executive function skills. In today's episode, Seth is going to get into the nitty gritty about specific strategies he uses to address different executive functioning challenges that show up in kids in school and in life. As he said during our conversation, taking all of this in is kind of like drinking from a fire hose. There is a lot of useful content and it's a lot to absorb. So I suggest you listen to this more than once if you need to, take notes, and definitely head over to Seth's website at sethperler.com and check out all of his fantastic videos and articles and other resources he has available. Helping kids with executive functioning challenges is Seth's passion, and he is really good at what he does. I'm so grateful to be able to share his wisdom with our community. So now without further ado, here is part two of the Executive Functioning Masterclass with Seth, and Just a heads up, we are going to be jumping in right where we left off last week. Okay, that brings us to number 17, which is Franken study, which according to the last podcast we did, I mentioned at the end that this was the most important key concept because this is the concept that has real nuts and bolts strategies that you can use with schoolwork. The reason I came up with the word Frankenstudy was based on a guitar called Frankenstrat, which is a guitar made of all these different parts. But a lot of times we think um, that there's like one way to do things, how to do school. And Franken's study really represents that you have to find personalized strategies for your child. They need to have strategies that work for them, not for everybody else. And these these atypes, these neurologically atypical kids, these outside the box kids, these differently wired kids, They need things that are really tailored to their idiosyncrasies. And when you start to do these different strategies that I'm about to talk about, there will be a domino effect. In other words, they will affect other things positively. So really think about where to put your energy with your child on the ones that I'm about to mention, what to focus on first, because there's a lot of different things to do. Um, One of the things is planners. Planners I know that for some of you listening, your child won't use a planner at all. This is definitely is more important in middle school, high school, and college, and, and it's where you see the resistance a lot, but a lot of them won't use them at all. Um, some of them have online calendars, some have physical planners, et cetera. It is so important with executive function that kids learn to plan, learn to talk through their plan, think through their plan. They do not know how to plan. And if they don't figure out how to plan, they will not be able to execute major goals in their life and their future. So these learning planners is key. Unfortunately, a lot of times what we do to teach them planners doesn't work. For example, schools often will hand out planners and require that the kids use the school planner. But these planners, you can't buy a set of a thousand planners for a thousand kids and expect that it's a cookie cutter thing that's going to work for everybody, especially if you have an asynchronous learner 
they might need a different type of planner. Now, these school planners often have visual clutter, meaning they have cutesy colors and drawings and famous quotes and things like that, which are nice if you're a linear thinker and you aren't distracted by that. But you're, if you're easily distracted, to me, you don't want that stuff. You don't want the periodic table and commonly misspelled words in the back of your planner. You don't want the school handbook in the front of the planner. I want my kids, when I'm teaching them to plan, to have a planner, just a basic planner. I don't want distractions. I want to teach them to plan. So I usually ditch the school planners and I usually get a monthly planner for the students I work with, not a weekly, not a daily. Those are good for very detailed people, but not for people struggle with executive function. In my opinion, 90% of the kids that I work with benefit from a monthly planner. I rip out every single page that is not a planner and I leave them with 11 or 12 pages for the school year because the school year is only 10 months long and I usually get the planners with lines in them because a lot of my kids have big handwriting or messy handwriting. So I want those lines in those little boxes, but they are global big picture thinkers. They are not detail oriented kids. So giving them the global big picture of the whole month is so helpful to them. And then teaching them how to write shorthand. A lot of times parents will say, well, what about all the things they need to write? Well, I teach them to write it with shorthand so that they can actually use the planner effectively. Um, I have a lot of this on my website that where I talk a lot about planners in depth. But it's very important, again, to Frank and study your planner. Frank and study also includes doing a daily plan, which I talk about on my website. Kids need to plan when they get home what they're going to do that night. A lot of times they just get home and linear kids, they know in the back of their head, oh, I got to do this, this and this. They pull out their planner, look at it, make a plan, do their homework. But for kids who struggle with executive function, they need to consciously make a daily plan. I have those on my website, too, that you can print for free the way that I do it. I've been doing this for many years, so I just want to recommend that you use this because I make it easy. But one thing that's key on this, if you do nothing else in the daily plan, the number one key I would recommend is that you ask your child, what is the MIT or NOP for tonight? What is your most important thing or your number one priority, the MIT or the NOP? What's your most important thing tonight or what's your number one priority tonight? And then use wait time and wait till they say their answer. Oh, well, I have a test on Friday. I need to study. Oh, I have to work on my draft. I want them at least to figure out what their most important thing is because that will help with prioritization, which is another part of executive function that they need to learn to do, to prioritize. So to ask them that question, what is your most important thing today? And then you can ask other questions like, how long do you need to do that? You know, But I want them really to learn to focus on one thing. Okay, do your most important thing until it's done. Don't start seven assignments and then not turn any of them in, which so many of our kids do. Let's learn the skill of doing one most important thing at a time. Uh, again, I could go on with that for 20 minutes, but I won't. <laughs> I'll, get a, <laughs> I'll get on to folders. Keep it simple. KISS, K-I-S-S. Keep it super simple. Folders. We have folders, we have binders. A lot of schools require kids to use three ring binders. Three ring binders are horrible for kids with executive function because they require too much detail time. They don't care. Just get them simple, clearly labeled, cheap paper folders, color coded for the classes. That's what I do. I talk more about that on my site so you can see how I do it. And I, I've been doing this for years. I get kids set up with simple systems and they will say, oh, my gosh, these folders are so much easier than the binders. I can find my stuff. And so there's nuance around that. But check it out on the site if you want. Next, they have to have a sacred study space. The worst place in the world for a kid to study is on their bed. Probably the second worst place would probably be on the couch, although sometimes if they're reading or so, some things can be done there. But they need a sacred study space. They need to consciously design a space, just like you and I were getting on the podcast. You know, we both have our desk areas that we very consciously designed for our work. They need a place where they can work that is free of distractions and that is optimized for focus. I call it a sacred study space. Is it at the kitchen table? Is it in their bedroom? Is it in the living room? I don't know. But you want the best place in the house where they can focus and remove distractions. Next is browser optimization. So 
you want to consciously set up your browser. Kids, you do a lot of their school online nowadays. So the browser has to be optimized for that. What I do is I set up on, I use Chrome, Google Chrome with my kids. I set up what's called the um, bookmarks bar, which is where you save your key bookmarks. And I set up the most important bookmarks right there in their face. So they do not have to ever look for it because it's right there. And the things that will set up on there are things like their teacher web pages, their Schoology or their Infinite Campus or whatever programs their grades are hosted on, um, where their assignments can be located, the school homepage, um, Google Drive, Google Calendar, Gmail. So those are probably the most important ones that I set up right in front of their face. And I like to have it so that when they open the browser, it automatically opens tabs the tabs that I like to automatically open, the first tab I like to open is their calendar because it shows what they need to be doing that day. The second tab I like to have it automatically open is their grade one because they often are not aware of their grades and they learn need to learn to check their grades more uh, regularly. The next one is the email and then the, the rest of them can be in the bookmarks bar. I hope that made sense. Yeah, no, that's a tip I've never heard before and makes so much sense. I love that idea of having the tabs open up right away. And that is brilliant. Well, the more work they have to do for non-preferred activities, the less likely they are to do it. So this just makes it very easy. So the next one is related to the last one with the browser, but is to get them checking their grades at least weekly. And I don't care the percentage of the grade. I don't care that it's an 84.2% or it's a 17%. I care about the detailed view where you can see the actual assignments that are missing incomplete or where you can find patterns. So getting used to checking their grades at least weekly. And a lot of times, parents, you know that you don't check them until six weeks in and then you go, oh, my gosh, how come you're failing four classes? <laughs> so to get it on the tab so that it opens and you don't have to even think about it. And do you just quickly, is that something that you work with them to set up, you know, what is your plan for this? What are you going to check this on Wednesday evenings or do you kind of figure that out with them? Yeah, I personally always recommend Sunday nights. The only reason I do that is it's a great time to close out your previous week and prep for your upcoming week. So I like Sunday nights personally, and that's what I recommend to everybody. But I have kids that have activities on Sunday nights or whatever. And it depends. Some of them are really like right now it's the end of the semester as you and I are making this recording. So I have kids where I'm having them check them almost daily because they're like, really trying to dig themselves out of a hole right now or something like that. So it just depends on how independent the kid is, but at least weekly. And yeah, I, and what you said about asking them brings up the concept of um, ownership and buy-in. So the more you're asking them, when's a good day for you? And you can say, I suggest Sundays, but what do you think? You know, to make it their idea, the more likely they are to buy in and do it. Mm hmm. So the next thing in Franken studying is that you have to have clearly identified routines. Uh, a lot of times these kids do their homework when they feel like it. Well, that's fine for somebody who's really linear and who's going to track all the details and be on top of it and who doesn't procrastinate. But for these kids, the more you can identify, print up, post on the wall routines so that you don't forget the routine, the better routines for leaving the house. Routines for doing homework, routines for doing your daily plan when you get home or whatever the routines are. And in the the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, he has a great uh, section about calling in the muse and routines. So I'm not going to go into that. But if you guys want to look that up, I highly recommend it. I buy that book, The War of Art, for many of my high school and college students as a gift. Yeah, it's fantastic. I love it. That's a great recommendation. It's a bit mature. So beware, but yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic about resistance. Next is be visual, out of sight, out of mind. I am crazy about using sticky notes and giant notes for kids and making things very visual, out of sight, out of mind. These are the kids that are not tracking details. The more visual you can make the things they need to remember, the more visual you can make your routines, the more visual you can make chores or any responsibilities, the better. Yep, that's awesome. Next is timers. I cannot tell you how much I love my timers. <laughs> 
these kids do not have a realistic idea of how long things take. How long will your homework take? Oh, that'll take me about five minutes. Cool. Let's time it. I set the timer for five minutes and it goes off and we've done two problems Mm -hmm. out of 10. Okay. You want to reevaluate that? Um, I want them to learn to calibrate time. I want them also to use the timer to help get started and do short bursts because these kids are overwhelmed. They don't want to do their homework. They think it's going to take them three hours and it may take them three hours, but they can't get started. So they spend so much time procrastinating. The timer, I do not want them to use the timer on the phone, by the way, because that opens up distractions with the phone. I want them to have a separate digital timer. And I want them to make very short bursts. Can you work on your math for 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's set it for 10. Can you work on it for five minutes? No. How about three? No. How about one? Okay. Then we'll set it for one. I don't care about a lot, so much of the game. Okay. Listen very carefully, parents and teachers to this. So much of the game with kids who struggle with executive function has to do with task initiation or self-starting and they procrastinate. And we like to think that they're not motivated, but it's eating the elephant. They're overwhelmed by what they perceive to be the gravity of what they're expected to do. So they will procrastinate because it's emotionally overwhelming. Timers help make this concrete. They help make it easier. They help get a little bit of a start. And a lot of times you just have to get them to start a little bit. We'll be right back after this quick break. Maybe I've watched too many seasons of The Amazing Race, but every time I have to go somewhere on the subway, I treat it like a competition. It's all about making the right gut decisions about which route will get me there the fastest. Sometimes those decisions get me where I'm going early and other times my gambles don't really pay off. Probiotics can't help with most gut decisions, but if your gut needs a little support, Ritual has your back. Their Symbiotic Plus, a three-in-one supplement, has clinically studied prebiotics, probiotics, and a postbiotic to support a balanced gut microbiome. I've been using Symbiotic Plus for about six months now, and it's become a core part of my morning routine. I take the mini capsule every morning while making my way through my inbox, whether I'm at home or I'm on the road, because it doesn't need to be refrigerated. And the capsule itself is delayed released, which helps it survive the harsh conditions of the upper GI tract for delivery to the colon. And that's exactly where we want it to go. Ritual invested in a study modeling the human colon, which showed that Symbiotic Plus significantly increased microbial diversity and the growth of beneficial bacteria. There's no more shame in your gut game. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. Get 25% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash tilt. Start Ritual or add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash tilt for 25% off. During this month of planning and organization for big transitions, rhythms and routines have been absolutely essential for our physical and emotional well-being. So Green Chef nights are reliably and predictably a good night. We know the ingredients will be fresh and prepped, the instructions easy to follow, and the meal delicious. We're all still talking about last week's turkey tacos with mango chimichurri sauce, refried beans, and Monterey Jack cheese. Green Chef contributes to a healthy lifestyle with easy and delicious menus like fresh seasonal salads and grain bowls, and with over 80 weekly meal and market options, plus rotating options to suit a variety of lifestyles, whether Mediterranean, plant-based, calorie-smart, keto, protein-packed, gluten-free, there are always plenty of options to choose from. Whatever you select, you'll get farm-fresh ingredients, organic whole fruits and veggies, and premium proteins all delivered straight to your door. I love those four words straight to my door. Oh, and one more thing I love about Green Chef, they have an app, which means it's easy to manage meal preferences and delivery from your phone if you want to. And I, for one, want to. I am in that mode where I'm making the most of little moments like waiting in line at the pharmacy or for the F train to pull into the station to tackle all of those to-dos. So the convenience of an app is key for me. Green Chef has a special offer for Tilt listeners. Go to greenchef.com slash Tilt50 and use code Tilt50 to get 50% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's 50% off plus 20% off your next two months when you use the code Tilt50 at greenchef.com slash Tilt50. Yeah, we've used timers for years, but and I some of it effectively, including doing the burst, but I really love the suggestion of 
saying, try this for two minutes. What do you think? Three minutes? I could see that making a huge difference already. Yeah, they're they're so helpful. I know a lot of people are just going to say, oh, I don't want to spend $12. It is a ridiculous price for a 25 (laughs) cent (laughs) electronic (laughs) device, but but go buy a few time fifty dollars worth of stupid timers and use them. <laughs> yeah. Next one in the Franken study series is the I was talking about Sunday night before is the Sunday night overhauls of your systems. I really recommend at least once a week doing an overhaul of all of your systems, meaning pull every single thing out of the backpack in the locker, put it on the ground, go through it, recycle the things you don't need, archive the things you might need put the things that are current back into the folders, update the planner, cross off everything from last week, prep it for the upcoming week, check your online grades, check your teacher websites, check your syllabi, um, overhaul all the systems for hmm, anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour every single week. It will save you tons of time and frustration. That is a good tip. It's something I just personally, I do for myself, and I never hold Asher to it. And I bet a lot of parents are in the same place that we're doing it for our kids. Yeah. And if they, like I said before, if they literally can't, if they don't have the ability to do it, go ahead and do it for them. Scaffold it for them. That's something you can take on if you have time. Um, but you want to do what's called a gradual release of responsibility. So week after week, month after month, you want to get them doing more, taking on more and more of it with you mm-hmm. uh, until they become responsible and independent with it. But even if you have a ninth grader, they may not be capable of doing, I I can't even tell. I mean, I work with high school and college students too. I I have college students who I'll hold up a paper and say, uh, what's this one? And they say, oh, I don't need it. And I say, are you sure? And they say, um, wait, oh yeah. (laughs) You know, so these are not detail oriented kids. So, you know, you want to walk them through what they can do and they need to have a life. So if it takes them an hour to do this and it would take you five minutes and you really want them to go out and play and you can take that on, go ahead and do it and make them do something, you know, just build on a little bit Mm -hmm. and let, let it be that for now. Okay, great. Next wait time when you're questioning your child. So you want to wait. Um, I think I mentioned that already though, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm not going to go into that again, but that, relates to the next one, which is abstract versus concrete. Their stress and their overwhelm, um, their resistance comes from things that feel abstract. The more you can help them make things feel concrete, the more likely they are to do it. So like timers are very concrete. They're auditory because you hear them. They're visual because you see them and they're kinesthetic because you touch them. So timers are great. They're very concrete. It really helps them For example, start your daily plan is very concrete, whereas they might think, oh, I have homework. Once they make a daily plan, they say, these are the specific concrete things I have to do for homework. Teacher expectations oftentimes feel very abstract. So if you don't know what they are, you need to get concrete. Ask the teacher what the expectation is. And the more concrete you feel about that, the more you can help your kid. So anyhow, the concept of abstract versus concrete was the next one. And the last one on this little Franken study section is you have to understand that when your child is studying or doing their homework, they have to get into study mode. And this is similar to like emotional regulation. They have to regulate their emotions. They have to be in a regulated place to get into study mode. They can't be anxious and stressed out. They have to get into the mode. Ideally, When you and I started today, I know I spent time prepping for today. I'm sure you spent time prepping for today. We got in the mode to do this podcast. And as adults, we have that skill. But for kids, they don't often think that and they think they're just going to dive in. No, you want to get into the mode. You want to get into the study mindset. How do you do that? Three ways. One, you organize your area. So I want them to organize their sacred study space get everything ready, get their folders out that they're going to need and stuff like that. Two, you're going to plan. They're going to make their little daily plan for the night and list out the things that they need to do very simply. Three, they're going to execute. They're going to start and start again. They're going to use that timer in their plan to start and know that they're going to get distracted, expect it, don't shame themselves for it. And when they get off track, get back on track, start and start again. Again, you got to get organize your area, you got to plan your study session and then you start and start again. So you got to get in the mode of studying. You got to get regulated. And that's the last one in the Franken study. 
And then I have number, going back to our original big list, number 18, the bonus. Your kid has to be a kid, whether they're in college, high school, middle school, elementary school, it doesn't matter what age. They have to be a kid. They have to have fun. They have to play. They have to be living their life. I don't want my students taking so many courses that they don't, like in college, that they don't have time for themselves. I don't want them taking so many courses in high school that they're they're so worried about, oh my gosh, I need this for my college apps, or doing so many extracurricular activities that they don't have time just to be. They have to have fun. They have to play. They have to be a kid. This is very similar to the thing that I said was the most important thing with your relationships. They ha- You have to have great relationships with your kids, and your kid has to have a life. Don't ever forget that. Yeah, and that ties back to that taking a big step back too, and looking at the big picture. So I love that you wrapped up with that. That's great. Wow. So that's it, folks. (laughs) Yeah, that was 18 strategies. And one of them, the Franken study had like several, several details. So I'm really sorry, guys, that that took so long. But that to me, if you guys attack this stuff, you will do what I'm doing. I'm in the business of helping families change their experience. I want their their lives to change. I'm not in the business of, of just trying a bunch of stuff and seeing what works. I want to do things that work. If you guys adapt a good handful of this stuff, you will see changes. Look for the small micro successes and build upon them so that your kid can execute and build the future that they want. And that's it. <laughs> so, so inspirational. It really is. I mean, I think, again, we do tend to get so mired down in the nitty gritty and it feels overwhelming to us sometimes all these different things. But it's so good to hear that if we work on these things and are consistent, that we'll be making progress that we just need to. I mean, I think a lot of it is relaxing about the timeline and realizing that these kids are on a different timeline mm-hmm. and that's OK, you know. Very well put. Yeah. So. Okay, first of all, this has been amazing. And I want to just encourage all our listeners to go to Seth's website. It is got so many great resources on it. And I'm going to be downloading uh, the daily planner, I use a version that I created, but I'm so curious to see what you did, because I think mine is not super effective at the moment. But definitely go check out everything that Seth has available on the website. Do you feel like we have time to answer a question or two? Or I I would love to. So let's do some rapid fire questions. Yeah. Okay. Because I got a lot of questions from people on both Twitter and the Facebook page. Um, I'll do as many as you want. Okay. This is from someone who has a 14-year-old freshman. And this parent's been working since kindergarten on trying to support their kids, their child, and learning executive functioning. She says, forming the habits is where he's stuck. If you ask him, he knows all the suggestions, tricks, and tips. He just continues to not use them. He thinks he doesn't need them and doesn't face the reality of his vulnerabilities. Do you have any suggestions on how to help him form those habits if he's resistant to it or thinks he doesn't need it? Yeah. I mean, resistance is the problem. That's in, again, with Stephen Pressfield's book, um, that, that is the main thing that we're dealing with. And resistance has a lot to do with the emotional regulation piece. And the email that you just read also has to do not only with emotional regulation, but also obviously with mindset and probably many other things that we just talked about. So um, when I'm dealing with a kid who's really resistant like that, that you have a long way to go in terms of helping this child change. And that's okay. Um, You want to be very realistic about where you're at and then think about where you're trying to get to. And where you're trying to get to is a place where they have mindsets that will work for him, that he will have mindsets that work. So he wants to have a growth mindset, a mindset you know what, I can do this and I, I need to be more realistic about this and I'm not being honest with myself all the time. So when, when I'm trying to work with a kid like this, I have to really, like I said earlier about building rapport, I have to build that rapport and get them to feel emotionally safe. And it's very millimeter by millimeter in a case like this where a kid is so stuck. So I really want to use that three to one rule. I really want to help them understand their strengths. I really want to give them ownership and buy in. I really want to say to them, what what are your dreams? What are your hopes? Um, And if they're super shut down, he might say, I don't have any. I don't care. You know, I don't I don't think about that stuff. But then I would use wait time. And really, I wouldn't interrupt. And I would just be like, cool, tell me more. Yeah, 
goals are stupid, blah, blah, blah. Cool. Tell me more. And wait, I, but I, what I really want to do is get serious, you know, because I know that there is something in there that's important to them, but I really want to create that emotional safety to say, I'm really listening to you. Okay. Well, what matters to you and what are your goals? So first there has to be some buy-in. And, um, as far as the, the not being realistic, I, I mean, I, myself, I, I find it easier to work with kids who are struggling with that because I went through it myself. So if you're a very structured linear parent, it might be good to get a, a friend, relative coach, um, psychotherapist or somebody who your child can really relate to that can start to just crack the door open a little because what you need is not, again, I talk a lot about micro successes and, and success in millimeters. You need someone who can help him just crack the door open a little bit and then a little more and a little more and a little more, and it will have the cascading effect. But I'm not going to lie to you. You, you, have a, you have a long journey ahead of you, you know, but this, you can do this. You can help your child change. Did that answer it? That was great. That was answering it and more, but all good stuff. So thank you. Um, Here's a question. This parent wants to know, is there a relationship between low working memory processing speed and executive functioning? Do you know scientifically or if those two are connected? Okay. Do I know scientifically? I don't know scientifically. I know what I think and what I hope this answers your question, but they are definitely related because executive function has to do with how we execute and processing absolutely has to do with how we are able to execute. So if you're trying to process information and you're and you have a slow processing speed, any type of slow processing speed, and especially if the parent or teacher doesn't see this because it's going on inside your brain. So they don't know that you're not taking it all in or if you're processing at home and it takes more time that definitely affects how we execute. And working memory is definitely part of executive function. That's like how we're able to juggle small concepts in our mind as we're doing something. For example, if you did a math problem and you said, what's 162 plus 53, you have to juggle the hundreds place, the tens place, the ones place. Is it addition or subtraction, multiplication or division? You have to juggle a lot. That's working memory. Working memory is not just math. It's all kinds of things. So they're definitely related. But what it makes me really think about is I get a, I read a lot of neuropsych reports and I get a lot of students with huge discrepancies, a kid that might be in the 99th percentile in one thing and the five percentile in another thing. I see this a lot. That is your classic asynchrony. But that's what we talked about before with super asynchrony. If you have a kid who has a few things in the high 90s and a few things in the single digits, those are giant discrepancies. And here's the problem I see with giant discrepancies. Giant discrepancies often cause teachers and parents to think, well, I know he can do it. I can tell. I know you're smart, you know. Um, so why aren't you doing it? And then that tends to cause uh, a very unrealistic expectation between the can't and won't, where they literally can't. They are brilliant in certain ways, and and so they're perceived as being someone who won't. Or the opposite also happens, where the the disabilities can outshine the the strengths. So you can see a neuropsych report, but the things that are that are easy to tangibly see as strengths. For example, um, verbal ability, they might not have. So if they're not very verbal, they, and, but they might be gifted in other ways, they might not even see the gifts and they might not be building those strengths. We'll be right back after this quick break. Hey there, it's Debbie. I love making this show and sharing conversations about how to support our awesome neurodivergent kids. I've seen how even one little insight from an interview can spark a big shift in daily life. But I know that raising complex kids can be messy and lonely. And just when we think we figured it out, something comes up that boots us right back to feeling overwhelmed and stuck. That's why I've poured everything into creating a way for parents like us navigating complex parenting journeys to join together and chart a path that feels positive, hopeful, and doable. It's the brand new Differently Wired Club experience. In the club, you'll get personal support from me and other seasoned parent coaches, six live calls every month where you can connect and get your personal questions answered, the opportunity to learn directly from authors and experts like I have on this show, 
monthly themes for getting specific and tactical, an exclusive private podcast feed, and the best, most generous community of parents. Seriously, these folks show up for themselves and each other, and that right there is really everything. Because it's a daily reminder that we're not alone. Our kids aren't broken, and we have totally got this. The recently rebooted Differently Wired Club is on a brand new platform with its very own iOS and Android app. It is such a great space. However you learn, whatever your style, no matter the ages, genders, and neurodivergent profile of your children, the Differently Wired Club can help you cultivate the positive shifts you're hoping for. Join us today by going to tiltparenting.com slash club. That's tiltparenting.com slash club. I hope to see you on the inside. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. Awesome. Thank you. Um, someone wants to know if you have any book recommendations or resources for parents who are trying to make a difference at home. A lot of parents um, gravitate towards Smart But Scattered, which can be an overwhelming book for some people because it's so jam-packed. Do you have any other favorite resources? Or maybe the question should be, when are you writing your book? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> my blog, I wish I could have it more organized like a book, but there is so much there uh, for free. So uh, when am I writing my book? Um, I would like to commit to within the year. Awesome. Um, hmm. How the Gifted Brain Learns, I love. The Autonomous Learner Model, I love, and that's great for homeschoolers just to sort of have a great understanding of how to teach in an unconventional way. Um, the Teenage Brain is fantastic. Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain is fantastic. The War of Art for Mindset. Mm, I, I wish I had known this question earlier because I, I would go grab a handful. And... Well, that's great. I mean, those are all, that's already a great place to start. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, okay, so one thing that came up a lot with people is intrinsic motivation and self-care things like brushing teeth and personal hygiene things. A lot of parents are feeling frustrated that their child doesn't seem to place any value on that or they're not motivated to do that. And I think a lot of parents end up, you know, holding screen time or other things over their kids' heads in order to do that. Do you have any thoughts on that? That is a great question. People don't want to do things that they don't want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I hear this a lot more than you could imagine. And it might be have to do with any type of self-care thing. It might have to do with laundry food in the bedroom, brushing teeth is very common, bathing. So more than you'd ever imagine, I, I hear about things like this. And my thing is this, again, people don't want to do what they don't feel like doing. They don't want to do things that are not high interest, that are not fun, that, or even if there's sensory issues going on in these cases, like there might be sensory issues that we don't even know are going on, like very, very, very high sensitivity with the toothbrush. Like it may actually be painful, um, but they're not saying that or don't, don't know how to articulate that. Um, tags on, on shirts, things like, like some people have extremely heightened senses that, that might be coming into play. But anyhow, the point is, is that when I'm dealing with someone who's really resistant on something that's really important for them to do, my thing is, is that I'm not, this is very important, parents and teachers, I am not 
trying to convince them they already know it's good for them. They already know it's bad for them if they don't do X, Y, and Z. There's no sense in trying to convince them of that. I would rather strategize by trying to get them to take some ownership in conversation, if I can. Do you think this is important? How is this important to you? Why is this? Oh, okay, why isn't it important? Go back to the wait time and have dialogue around it, but have them be doing most of the talking. You want to focus on asking the right questions and get to the root of what's really going on. Then, because it's an emotional issue, it's not <laughs> in some way, shape or form, I guarantee you, these are all emotional issues. It's not about what we think is the surface issue. It's not about rationally explaining to them what they need to do and being logical, okay? So having said that, how do I get kids to start to do these things that they need to be doing? Well, what I do is I scaffold, and it has to, remember I said concrete versus um, abstract? It has to be concrete, and eating an elephant, it has to be bite size. And when I say bite size, I mean tiny, 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 tiny bite size. So. I, I use an example where I say, all right, can you write a page? And the student says, no. Okay, can you do a paragraph? No. Can you do a sentence? No. Can you do a word? No. Can you do a letter? No. Can you do a dot? Okay. Like you have to back up to where they can start. So let's say that it's a toothbrushing thing. You know, I might start with, um, okay, can you at least brush your teeth for two seconds without even having any toothpaste on it? And that may sound ridiculous to some people listening, but you have to start with something that's not overwhelming. It has to feel emotionally safe and it has to feel doable to them. OK, you have to find that threshold and you're going to have to scale way, way back. And again, there can be a cascading effect. So once you get them started a little bit, a little bit more and a little bit more, then you can open the door way more eventually. So it's very hard, I think, because parents are like, this needs to happen now. And you're right, it does, but it's not. So you need to back up and really feed the bite size so tiny for whatever issue you're working on. That was a great answer. Thank you. That that answer alone is going to change people's experience and their kids' experience. So thank you. So Seth, I'm going to wrap this this baby up. It's, um, this has been just an incredible episode. It's the longest episode we've done. And I have a feeling it's going to be one of the most listened to episodes we've done. But um, before we go, I know that parents are going to want to get in touch with you. And you've mentioned your blog and the resources. How can people find you and where can they find you? Okay, so go to sethperler.com, S-E-T-H-P-E-R-L-E-R.com. And on the homepage or any number of the pages, you can subscribe. So put your name and email in there and I will send a, um, a toolkit where I send out five or six extensive videos that are fun. I made them for kids, except for the first one, which is for parents, but I'm actually speaking to your child and kids like these in middle school, high school and college kids like these videos. Um, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Seth Perler. And every time I post, if you click the bell, it'll alert you whenever I put up a new video. And please, if you like what I'm doing, share it with your friends, share it on your Facebook group. I would really appreciate if you share my work with people who it might help. Perfect. Well, thank you. Yeah. And again, listeners, I'll leave links to everything, all the books that Seth recommended, all the resources, and then all the different ways to connect with Seth. And I'm on his newsletter list and the toolkit is fantastic. So I definitely recommend you do that. And Seth, thank you so much. My head is swimming a little bit, but I'm excited. <laughs> I feel very motivated and inspired. So thank you so much for today. Thank you, Debbie. This was a blast. You've been listening to the Tilt Parenting Podcast. For the show notes for this episode, including links to Seth's website and all the resources we discussed, visit tiltparenting.com slash session 97. If you like what you heard on today's episode, I would be grateful if you could take a minute and head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a rating or a review. Thank you so much. That really helps us stay visible so people who would benefit from this show can easily find it. Lastly, if you aren't already part of the online community at Tilt, please join us. Every Thursday, I send out a short email with a quick note for me, 
a link to that week's podcast episode and links to five stories from the news that week that are relevant to parents like us. You can sign up for that and learn about Tilt at TiltParenting.com. Thanks so much, and I will see you next week. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. With sometimes hilarious and always thought-provoking experts and friends, at Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark-Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast.